Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. I've talked about many times in this show that I used to be a professional musician. And I remember when I was a teenager, one of the first times we were going to perform in front of a, in, in, in front of what I considered kind of a significant size audience. And all it was, was a high school talent show, but there were going to be, the whole auditorium would be filled, which is, I don't know, five, 600 people were going to be there. And I remember being awake all night long the night before. I would, I think I would fall asleep for a few minutes and I just wake up and I stare at the ceiling. I could remember my heart pounding and just being, being nervous. And I think this happened the first couple of times that I had, had performances like that. And then after a while, I just, it stopped bothering me for some reason. But it, there was some. There was another thing, though, that I thought was kind of interesting because whenever you'd have those those feelings of of nervousness, which you you can't sleep, you have the the classic butterflies in your stomach, and you don't feel like eating. Well, there's something that happens when you move from uh, from that state into being on stage. And it's, it's so interesting because the nervousness just kind of disappears. And I think there's this other thing that sets in for a lot of people right around that time that that transition takes place. And although these things overlap, it seems that you, you transition from nervousness to feeling pressure. And although the two things seem to really overlap with each other, I think they're slightly different feelings. And I I did some reading to try to make sense out of this for myself, knowing that I was going to talk a little bit about this. And, 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 and the reason I want to talk about this is I, I found this really interesting article where the, they took 10 different people that were really, they were famous. uh, They were really famous during the middle of the 20th century. A lot of these are, maybe all of them are, anyway, these are these are athletes, largely, that get put in these really high-pressure situations. And, and so I started thinking, well, what really is the difference between when somebody's feeling nervous or when somebody's feeling pressure? And, and like I said, I, I thought that there was some sort of difference between those two things, although they have a lot of the same uh, symptoms, if you will, uh, but but they're they're slightly different emotions where the nervousness seems to be something that's more uh, situational and maybe even survival related where the pressure is more a feeling of the need for success and then I started thinking maybe another way to put this would be uh, I'm the uh, the the nervousness would be I'm nervous that a bear is going to kill me. The pressure is I I am worried that I may not kill the deer or my family won't eat. And so th- those are kind of the anyway. I don't know if that's the best way to put it. Maybe the nervousness is I'm nervous that the bear is going to kill me. Where the pressure is I am concerned I'm not going to kill the bear or my family won't eat. Sa- same bear slightly different feeling. One of them's nervous, one of them's pressure. Anyway, it, I, I, like I said, there was, there's, a, there's a difference there because what happens then when you, and I've noticed this, whenever I would be really, really nervous about something, that nervousness would go as soon as you got on that stage, the nervousness was gone, but there was this new thing about, okay, now I need to do, do well. Okay, so anyway, what I want to read to you today is, I, I loved this article so much. The, the, the title of the article is How the Champs Beat Tension. And, and this was put out in September 23rd of 1962. And although they use tension in the title, that's not really what this article is about. They immediately start talking about pressure. And it says, nowhere is there more pressure 
than in major sports. Here are the secrets of 10 men and women who've proved they can take it. Okay, yeah, so every so all these different people were sports. And and as I read this, I found 14 different things in here related to overcoming pressure. And I, I want to read this to you and kind of identify what some of these are, because I think that this is one of those things that the, the counsel or the ideas here are in some ways timeless. They would apply to pretty much anybody at any time, at least the, the principles here on how to overcome or how to manage the feelings of, of pressure. And like I said, I think that nervousness and pressure, they must overlap in many different ways, but it seemed to me that, and, and I think as they, I remember reading through this, that they kind of maybe use the ideas interchangeably, but I think there's something slightly different between those two, those two sensations or two feelings. So let's, let's jump through this. I think you'll really like listening to what each one of these people says. It's not that long, but, but there's 10 different people in this article that all talk about the things that they do to overcome the feeling of pressure. All right, so here we go. If you think you're under pressure on your job, consider what some of the nation's top athletes are up against. Take next week, for example, when baseball's champs play the World Series with the eyes of the whole U.S. on them. When you make a mistake, your boss is probably the only one who knows about it. When a World Series ball player bobbles a grounder or strikes out or throws a home run ball, at least 50 million people, uh, at least 50 million people mutter, he's a bum. <laughs> but the great athletes have succeeded in conquering this pressure and performing at their best. Take Whitey Ford, the ace left-hander of the New York Yankees, in establishing his reputation as baseball's best pressure pitcher. He has won a record nine series games. He has a startling record of 32 consecutive scoreless innings. Perfect pitching under pressure. Why does Ford pitch so well in the World Series? How do other great athletes conquer pressure? Maybe you can learn a trick or two from their secrets. And then this is where it begins to go through all these different, these different athletes as they talk about how they manage or overcome pressure. Whitey Ford. You've got to have confidence before a World Series game. When I walk into, a club, into the clubhouse, I never think I'm going to lose. I'm nervous, but that's good. Nervousness gets the adrenaline going. It's not the money that makes me nervous. The pressure comes from the national scope of the series. That's all you hear. Everybody is talking about it. Every time you turn on TV, they're announcing the starting pitchers. Everybody you know is calling you for tickets. Those little things create the pressure. I like to kid around in the clubhouse to loosen up, but when batting practice is over, there's no more time for jokes. That's when I check the scouting reports again on how to pitch to the other team's hitters. Low or high, inside or outside, fastballs or curves. I'm not an overpowering pitcher like Don Drysdale or Sandy Koufax, so I have to rely on knowledge of hitters and enough skill to pitch to their weaknesses. That's one of these keys here. Rely on knowledge of hitters and enough skill to pitch to their weaknesses. And to be able to rely on skill, I have to have confidence. Once I get the first batter out, I'm not nervous anymore. The pressure is off. Then I know I can count on skill. Okay, there's the first one. I love that. Jim Beatty, track star who broke the world two-mile record, first man to run the four-minute mile indoors. And this is what he says. I believe you should always look for the unexpected. The pressure is in winning, not in the time except occasionally when I try for a record, mo record mile. Let me reread re that so I can get it said correctly. The pressure is in winning, not in the time except occasionally when I try for a record mile. I know that I'm going to try to run a race that no one in the world has ever run, and this can overpower you if you're not alert for the unexpected. One of the big errors in track is to follow a set plan. 
because the element of competition will erase that plan 90% of the time. If your thinking revolves around what your time is going to be at the half mile and the element of competition is gone, you won't run as good a race. The unexpected includes considering every man on the starting line as a man to beat. I won races when I was the underdog, and someone is going to do the same thing to me, so I'm always ready. Okay, that's the next one. Okay, then this next one's awesome because you've certainly heard of him before. Legendary golfer Arnold Palmer. Okay, Arnold Palmer, world's premier golfer who won the Masters and British Open this year en route to a new money-winning record. Everybody seems to think that pressure affects a golfer when he's in a tight spot in a tournament. Maybe it works that way for some golfers, but not for me. For me, pressure exists when I'm in a slump. The only way to get out of a slump is work your way out of it. I was in a putting slump when Jack Nicholas beat me in the U.S. Open playoff, but I kept working until I got my putting stroke back in the British Open. Pressure is like learning to swim. When you learn to stay on top of the water, everything is easy. Until then, everything is hard. Okay, next one. Archie Moore, Boxing's Methuselah, who at the age of 45, or is it 48, hopes for a heavyweight title bout. And this is what he had to say. Conquering pressure is mind over matter. You can do it by practice. Your will and desire can conquer pressure. They can control your excitement. I conquered my emotions that year during the first of my many fights with Harold Johnson. I blooded his nose and knocked him down twice. That was the crossroads for me. After that, I knew I was a champion. As for fear of physical punishment, that never exists for me. I never feared a man physically. Okay. Here's the next one, Bob Cousy. I've never heard of this guy before, but they refer to him. I, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but this was written in 1962. And like I said, these are, these are principles that just kind of apply forever. And that's why I thought this was so interesting listening to these people. So Bob Cousy, basketball magician of the pro champion Boston Celtics. Then he goes, he says, I actually enjoy the pressure because I know it will make me play better. In the past few years, the only time I have felt the pressure has been during our postseason playoffs. I apply myself much better when the pressure is on. When the game starts, the pressure leaves me. I do things instinctively, except for a foul shot when everything stops and there's no time to think. But a few deep breaths relax me. Okay. Next one, Johnny Unitas, all-pro quarterback of the Baltimore Colts. The best way to beat the pressure is to prepare for the job. The most pressure for me comes right at the end of a tight game when we have to, when we have to score. We'll run six or seven plays in less than a minute, and it's no accident when we go over. We practice what to do in that situation. To save time, we don't even use a huddle. It's part of our preparation. In addition, I go to the movies four nights a week in my cellar. I look at films of our next opponents over and over again. I learn to recognize their defenses and the habits of their players. When you're properly prepared, you don't worry about the pressure because you know what you're doing. Okay, Willie Shoemaker. Ace jockey who has won more than 4,000 races and more than $25 million in purses. And he says, the secret is to forget your mistakes. In the 1957 Kentucky Derby, I was riding Gallant Man and I misjudged the finish, finish line. By the time I realized my mistake, Iron Liege had stolen the race. That bothered me for a long time, but I learned to forget it. I just try to learn from my mistakes and then forget them. Okay, next one. Pancho Gonzalez, longtime pro tennis champion and 1962 coach of the U.S. Davis Cup team. At a critical point in a match, sometimes I prayed. I'd ask for a little help. The times I remember the pressure most was when I was tired physically. 
That would make me aware that I wasn't at my best and that the pressure could get to me. That's why I always made it a point to be in top shape. Usually, though, my concentration on the match was so strong that I wouldn't let the pressure get into my mind. It's also possible to create pressure against an opponent by penetrating a weakness and making him more conscious of that particular weakness. Okay. Donna DeVerona, 15-year-old world individual swimming medley record holder. Now, this is what this person says. I'm superstitious. Before a big race, I'll count to four. That's my lucky number. And wear my good luck suit. Another thing I enjoy before a race is music. I like the fast stuff, like Elvis Presley, (laughs) because it peps me up. The pressure of being on top is a lot different than when you're coming up. I used to dream of winning. Now it's the nightmare of being afraid to lose. The most you can do is try your hardest. And I found I swim best when I'm nervous and count to four. Okay, Jacques Plant, all-star hockey goaltender for the champion Montreal Canadiens. And this is what he had had to say. Some people think there is more pressure on a goalie than on any other man in sports. The goalie usually makes a difference between winning and losing. And some goalies have suffered breakdowns. My answer to the pressure is sleep. When there's no game, I get to bed at nine. I try to take a nap every afternoon. When I'm driving to the game, I'll turn off the sports news on the radio. Uh, If you think about the game too much before it, it's sure to bother you. So forget it. Okay, so I wrote down, when I read through this before, I wrote down all these different things that that jumped out at me that I thought were really good. And so here's, here's 14... What I picked out of this, 14 ways to manage pressure. And these can apply, these obviously apply to these people in sports, but I think these can apply everywhere. These are kind of universal, great principles. So the first one that I, can't, that I noticed in there was understand your competition. And he talked about studying, uh, studying the team that you're up against. And that was measured a couple times in here. Making sure that, especially when you're entering into a sports situation, whatever it happens to be, understand your opponent, know how they do, know how they fight, know how you're going to be, how you're going to attack them. And, and this I think can be, uh, can be projected out into other things and not just your competition. But for example, if you're going to be giving a presentation, know your audience, know the room, know what your goal is, know what you're trying to accomplish and know what those pe- who the people are that you're speaking to. Because if you understand them, it will release some of the pressure because you, you, you understand who you're talking to. And you'll know, uh, you'll, you'll walk in there best prepared for that particular situation. Okay, that was the first one. The second one that I pulled out of there was this idea of getting an early win. Now, I, I gave a, one of these uh, shows I did a few weeks ago was about Tom Landry uh, from the Dallas Cowboys. And he has this, he had this whole principle, I remember, that the first game of the season, he wanted to win that thing. He needed to get that win early on to set the stage for what the season was going to be like. And it doesn't even, doesn't even have to just apply to a season. This can apply to just any given situation. A- as a performer, when you get up on that stage, you want to make sure that that first song that you do is something that you can do easy. Easiest thing you can do that's going to have the best potential for success and getting some sort of a response from the audience. You don't want to walk into that thing when you're at the edge of that nervousness and that first little feeling of pressure. You don't want to have the most difficult thing that you're going to do in the night. The one that's the most risky. If, if you're a public speaker, a comedian, whatever it happens to be, make sure that you lead with something you know is going to work and get that early win. Get that early laugh. Get that early response. Get that first thing. Because as soon as that happens, you just feel that release of pressure. We, as a performer, again, you'd get up and you do that first song. And once that first song is over, once those first few notes come out and you knock them out successfully, it just feels good. And you just feel the, you feel the, you feel the pressure going down. 
The third one that I noticed was the guy that talked about looking for the unexpected. And I, I hear people say this all the time, and I never really, really know what to do with that. Because if it's unexpected, then it's, it, you don't really know what's going to, but, but I guess the idea is to allow yourself to stay flexible. And, and he talked about, you know, you walk into that, if you have a game plan, you know that the game plan's not going to last. But you still, in my opinion, you need to walk in with a game plan. And then the pressure gets released a little bit, just recognizing that, that the game plan isn't going to survive meeting the, the competition. You walk into every situation with a plan, just be prepared as, you know, look for the unexpected. It's just being ready and, and recognize that that plan's not going to last you, you need to walk in with a plan and stick to it the best you can, but no plan survives meeting the competition. But that planning will release the pressure, just recognizing that you have to be flexible. Be flexible with that plan. The fo- f- uh, fourth thing was working through the pressure, or in other words, focusing on, your, uh, focusing on work. And that, it, to me, that's such an important thing that, that even, when you feel, even when you're feeling that pressure, it's just focus on effort, work, 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 and concentrate on working. And, and I think it was, was it the Arnold Palmer one, I think we read just a few minutes ago, and he was the one that made that comment, that it's just, you feel that pressure, you just keep working keep working, keep working. And that's how to, to relieve, that's for him how to relieve it. The next one was interesting that I came across because it was this whole idea of, of don't let, don't let fear control you. And, and there's, it, and what he goes on and says, use will and desire to create excitement. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing that, that if you, don't allow fear to excite to to control you. Use your will and your desire, and then you can turn that into excitement, and then that will overcome overcome your fear. Okay. Next thing. Uh, get good enough so that your instincts can set in. This is such an important principle, and. Again, when you're, I just look at myself as a performer, the best way uh, to overcome pressure, because sometimes you would have stuff like this when you get to the end of a night and you're in a performance or you need, you need to succeed or you need something to go well, you're better off if you have, if you know your music so well that it's just instinctual. You can go through a whole song and you don't even remember playing it because you've got it down. It's a little bit like when you drive to, to a store and you go, I don't even remember driving here. It, 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 that's, that's actually shows you that you've gotten so good at it that you're working on your instincts. You've practiced this over and over and over and you're able to focus on other things then. So anyway, that's the idea. Get so good that your instincts set in and that removes the pressure because you just know that you've got this. The next one was interesting that was kind of in passing. One of them said, and this is number seven that I noticed, was breathe deeply. And I did a whole podcast on this. I don't know what this is. This must have been five, six months ago, but it was on this whole idea of just breath. And, and you actually can change your physical reaction to things by changing the speed of your breath. And it's because when you start feeling nervous, or what do you start doing? You start breathing more shallow and faster. And so what you, you can manually offset it by, if you're feeling nervous, just slow, act like someone who's not nervous, which means slow down your breath and just start breathing slower. And that was what this person said, just breathe deeply. And if you just do that for a a few moments, you will feel that pressure or nervousness, whatever it happens to be, diminish. The next thing that that was specifically spelled out was just preparation. Be prepared. Spend enough time working on things. And this overlaps with some of these we've already talked about, like letting your instincts set in, but just be prepared be ready for whatever situation comes up. Make sure that whatever you're doing, you've gone over it and over it and over it again. And then, and that preparation can be a lot of other things too. For example, if I'm a performing musician, 
it isn't just that I know all of my songs. It's that I have a backup bass guitar in case one of my strings breaks. Th- th- see, it's, it's more than just I've worked on everything and I know how the song goes. I've got all of my backup plans ready to go. And it's interesting that when I would walk up on stage, whether I was playing guitar or, or bass in a particular setting in a different band, knowing that I had backup strings in my case, knowing that I had just had a backup plan in case something went wrong. And this is all part of preparation, making sure that you have not only have have prepared on the particular thing, but you have that backup plan ready to go and whatever, but you have everything, all your, all of your contingency plans in place is all part of preparation. And then again, these are little things you don't want to be worrying about. What happens if this goes wrong? What happens if this goes wrong? If this, again, something as simple that you don't think about often when you're playing guitar, what if my string breaks in the middle of a song? Do I have strings? You don't want to as you're walking up on stage going, oh my gosh, do I have strings? You should have already thought of that and this is all part of that. Be prepared. The next one, forget mistakes immediately. I think it was... I remember talking about this in one of my podcasts, and I didn't look for where it was, but I think it was Kobe Bryant. I could be wrong about this, but he talked about how when you're playing in a basketball game and you miss a shot, you let go instantly. Because because what a lot of people do is like, oh man, oh geez, geez, you know, you get all worried that you're, and then you're arguing at the ref, and and it's like, no, stop, get get over it, and get back down that court. Don't focus on what just went wrong. Focus on what you have to do next and and learn how to let go. I think this one was from that guy that was the jockey that said he made some big mistake and just stop. Don't dwell on it. Move on. Move on. You don't have time to sit and dwell on this. Go. Move. Move on. Next one I thought was interesting was pray. This whole idea of, uh, of, of looking inwardly. And so if you believe in God, ask for help. And if it's something beyond that, where you just, it's a little bit like what Tony Robbins talks about, where it's that feeling of grace that somehow the universe will look out for you and sometimes just give something to you, hand you things to help you succeed. So I thought that was interesting that somebody made that point, just overcoming pressure. Sometimes it's just a matter of, I have to take a moment and I just got to pray. Next one that I thought was really good was sleep. You want to overcome pressure, be well rested. Force yourself to sleep. And I, I, I've talked about this so many times in here, how I spent so much of my life, I would wear it like a badge on my sleeve that I su- could succeed with four hours of sleep. I could get by with that. And I can, but it's not, looking back now, that's not great. And it's amazing how much relief you feel and how much pressure in your life is reduced if you just allow your brain to reset. And frequently, I will take a nap in the afternoon. I do that actually a lot. It's not a long thing, but I just allow my brain again to reset. So So I allow myself to sleep, get many hours of sleep during the night, and then frequently in the afternoon, I'll just put my feet up or I'll go lay on a couch or something and I will just sleep for 20 minutes. And, and it's amazing how the feeling is of anxiety, nervousness, pressure, all those things, if you just allow yourself, your brain to reset through a little bit of sleep, how much those things will go, uh, will go away. Let's see here. Uh, Next one was making the competition feel weak. This one I thought was really interesting because it reminded me of, I don't remember which one it was, if it was Rocky three or four, but it was that moment that he, that he recognized, was it Apollo Creed made that comment? He's not a machine. He's not a machine. You you know, cause he made him bleed or something or he knocked him down or whatever. And, it, and, and Rocky all of a sudden felt like I, I, I can win this. I could actually pull this off. And so so anyway, that was uh, a, a really important moment in that that show because what he did is he 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 made the competition feel weak, but in the process he was able to feel strong, and so that was the 
uh, that anyway, that was the thing that that was uh, w- 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 that I thought was so important about that. You 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 make your competition recognize a weakness that they have, and then and it's not so much about what happens to them. I think then it's what happens to you after that, because then the pressure is off of you so much because then you recognize, hey, I can win this. Number thirteen. And this one was so interesting. And this over some of these overlap a little bit. Was the um, was the the be afraid to lose? And a- Andrew Huberman talks about this. I-, I watched this video of him some time ago where he says, you know, we're always told just focus on success. Don't think about losing. Focus on success. Don't be afraid of losing. And and he says, but the stats show that you're more than twice as likely to succeed if you are afraid of what will happen if you lose. And and he says, uh, let's see, you double your chances of success of reaching a goal if you foreshadow failure. If you think what is going to go, what's going to happen, what what is my failure going to, what, uh, what's going to happen um, if I don't? What, what does that failure look like? And then somehow... Being afraid to lose, afraid of failure, actually, amazingly enough, according to Andrew Huberman, and he showed it had a whole bunch of research on this, that there's nothing wrong with that, that that can actually double your chances of of success. And number 14 actually overlaps with one I just said. I had actually written them out separately because one of them was getting enough sleep, and then I actually added to it. The 14 was was taking a nap. So one of them is getting enough sleep during at night, and then the fourteenth one that I wrote down was was making sure that you. Uh, it, it was this other thing that this guy said at the very end. I try to take a nap every afternoon. So one of them is getting plenty of sleep at night, and then then I, I put this one as number fourteen is allow yourself during the day to reset and take a nap. So to me, that was the the 14th one. So now I want to, so anyway, those are 14 things that I pulled out. And if you heard something else in there that I missed, uh, th- those, anyway, I thought those were, those were really amazing. So I want to read one more thing to you because there was a, there's a psychologist that actually wrote a short little, just a couple of paragraphs about this article. And it's in the same newspaper. And he kind of points out what the things are that he noticed uh, about what they had to say. And so this is what, a, uh, what gives a champion confidence, a psychologist answers. Okay, here's his little thing. This is Edward Chauvin Jr., professor of clinical psychology at Columbia University. Again, this is 1962. Psychologically, and this is his response to this article, what he saw. Psychologically, psychologically, it seems clear that these champions rise above the distractions and disruptions of pressure through confidence. They are people who are out to win and are sure of themselves as winners regardless of the competition. But of what is their confidence compounded? From what they say, two elements seem paramount. First, there is sheer work. Long hours of conditioning, practice, studying an opponent, and preparing for the unexpected contingencies of a game, a race, a match. The confidence of champions seems founded on the rock of painstaking labor. Second, there is the acceptance of nervousness as a sign of readiness. Unpleasant as it is, tension indicates that the long cultivated skills and conditioning are ready for testing. Once the tests begin, conscious nervousness disappears as these great athletes focus all their concentration on performance. I, 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 that right there, I, I thought it was so interesting that he made that he made that observation and said that because this is something that again I had noticed earlier on in my life that that nervousness weirdly enough just dissipates. The moment you hit that stage, the nervousness is gone. It's so weird and odd that that happens. But something different kind of sets in at that point. And that's what I was trying to make that differentiation between the nervousness and the pressure. That, that now I'm on stage and we're, and we're performing. And now, although I, I feel comfort, comfortable in a different way, there is still this, this sensation, a little bit of, of pressure to now perform 
correctly and make sure that, that I don't miss an opportunity, that I succeed. Okay. Everybody has his individual way of preventing tension from building uh, to too high a level too far in advance. Like plants sleeping or Miss De, v- De Verona's counting to four. And I'm going to wrap it up here with this last line. But the values of unremitting preparatory work and the acceptance of nervousness as a positive sign of readiness hold lessons for all of us in sports, business, and life. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. <laughs>